You do not want to miss this episode. It's the March update at Control and Compound. Hi, everyone. I'm Darren Mitchell, and joining me as always, Christina White. Christina, how are you doing today? Hey, Darren. I am doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing well. We get all kinds to talk about today. But before we do, we're, we're, we're recording this on March 1st, and uh, Brian Mulroney passed away yesterday. I was sad to hear that. He uh, he was one of my favorite prime ministers. He uh, he 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 did some really cool things. He stopped the acid rain coming from the states. He got Reagan to to do that. Uh, I actually got to meet meet him when I was a child when he was running in uh, Nova Scotia for his seat when he first became leader. And I thought it was really cool. Jean Kretsch gave a great uh, speech last night uh, talking about uh, you know what great friends they were and what a great guy they were and people from all parties. Uh, you know, it was the old style politics. Kretschez said, you know, we disagree on the ice, like a hockey hockey team, right? You disagree on the ice and then you go have a beer afterwards. And that's how uh, him and Mulroney got along. So great Canadian prime minister gone. So uh, sorry to hear that. Yeah, but, sad to hear. And they, they just don't make them like that yeah, anymore. And, you know, right? Kret- good for Kretschez, giving a great talk. Uh, so appreciate that. But we're in the March update. We get all kinds of stuff going on uh, in the the economy. Why don't uh, we start right off with the Bank of Canada, one of our things we talk about every, every month. What's going on with the Bank of Canada and interest rates? So we haven't had an update from Bank of Canada since January 24th when we and we had announced that back in our February update that they had held um, that rate at 5%. So the next um, announcement is coming up on March 6th. So we've only got a few days and we'll see what happens. And here we go with our predictions. As always, everybody's talking about it, what's going to happen with that announcement. So, of course, we go back to inflation because that is where they are, you know, why we had had these increases in the first place. Um, So CPI and core inflation um, was actually down in January. So it came in at 2.9%. Um, and the central bank is targeting about 2%, so 2.9 to 2%. So a lot of people are saying, oh, my gosh, this is it. We're going to see the rate cuts in uh, in March. Uh, I, I don't believe so. Um, reason for that mostly is because although the, you know, the CPI, like it's down, many end of the goods and services are still really high. Like we know this from day-to-day life. Like is inflation really that much lower? Not so much. Um, so we see the rising cost in shelter. We've seen that forever for the last, you know, year, it's up 6% higher than they were a year ago. So that's obviously outpacing the overall inflation. Um, A lot of things too, like if we look at half of the CPI components, uh, they were growing at a rate above the 3%. So really, you know, the overall look of it is not giving the true picture as we've always talked about. So they're saying that, you know, Economists expect that the Bank of Canada will begin cutting the rates this year, um, but I don't think that we're going to see it. Um, I don't think we're going to see it yet, right? Like, I think it'll probably be more mid midsummer, like the June announcement, maybe. Um, but I wouldn't get too excited. Yeah, uh, hopefully by the June announcement. But the, the uh, we get some more good news uh, on uh, on the economy and uh, jobs, jobs in particular. If the jobs stay up, we might not get that uh, rate cut we're hoping for, and. You know, you know, I talk about inflation all the time. It's just don't believe the government numbers, right? It's it's that the, the way they do that basket of goods and CPI. It, it's uh, it's it, you ask the average person, their costs are up by more than what uh, what the government tells us inflation is. But that's what they use for setting the rates. So it is it is important. Yeah. So in, uh, kind of in line with that is the recession discussion, right? We're conti- continuously people. People are definitely feeling like we're in a recession based on the interest rates and where they are. Um, But on February 29th, they did announce the real GDP for last quarter, um, and it was actually up 1%. So that final quarter was up, which means by definition, we are not in a recession. Um, But again, those numbers are a little bit, you know, smoke and mirrors a little bit when you look at it, um, because the increase, it follows the decline of 0.5% in the third quarter. Um, So just a slight increase to avoid the word recession. But if we look at the growth in the fourth quarter, um, it's interesting to see that the rise is actually just in exports. Uh, Housing and business investment both fell. So like the, you know, some pretty big stuff, both fell, um, which is saying that really the U.S. might be propping us up with their spending trends, right? So that export is what boosted our Canadian exports, which made that GDP not great, but a little bit higher than negative, which kept us out of that recession definition. Yeah, I think I think the key there for me that 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 jumped out was business spending and investment down, and, and business when business spending and investment goes down, you know, 
that the, 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 the longer term implication of that is, you know, there's fewer jobs, fewer, fewer, fewer opportunities for the economy to grow because businesses are what drives the economy, not the government. So when business stops investing in their own businesses, you know, that's going to, that's going to have repercussions down the road. So that's a key number I always, I always look for and it doesn't look good right now in Canada. No, and Canadians just can't spend, right? We've talked about it um, a lot with those renewals coming up and the amount of mortgages that are coming up renewal for renewal over this next year at those higher rates. It just doesn't, consumer spending's down. We're, we're seeing it, we're noticing it, and it's because those those interest rates that are, and, and they're going to be locked in because most of the people will lock in at another five years. That's five years of spending that could be down, right? Yeah, so yeah, you, you think spending's down now, wait till those renewals come due and all of a sudden people are spending an extra fifteen, seventeen hundred $1,700 a month on their mortgage. mortgage. Well, there goes the discretionary spending on, on everything else. So we're going to see... Uh, I think we're not we're we're, we're going to see some uh, rough patches up ahead. Uh, it's all about that fine balance. Can we have a soft landing and 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 bounce back, or is it going to be a hard landing? I think that's the billion dollar question. Yeah. Okay, we're going to jump into the Canadian dollar. Pretty boring. Hasn't really done much. Just what did we say earlier? It's just hanging out at seventy four cents. Doesn't really hasn't really moved much. So nothing exciting going on uh, with the Canadian dollar. Just uh, hanging out at seventy four. Stock markets. Uh, Again, sort of the same thing we've been talking about the last year or two. U.S. stock market is up. The S&P 500 is up 7.3% year to date. Dow Jones up 3.3%. Uh, in Canada, the, the S&P TSX up 2.3%. Okay, so we've got better growth in the U.S. markets than we do in the Canadian markets. And I thought it was interesting to look at the five-year returns on those three markets. So if we look at the last five years... Um, the Dow Jones is up 49%. Okay. So five years till now is up 49%. S&P 500 in the U.S. is up 81%. And the TSX S&P 500 or S&P, uh, is up only 32%. So in the last five years, uh, Toronto or the Canadian markets are only up 32%. U.S. markets up 50 or 81%. So again, it all goes back to the to the decreasing productivity we're seeing in Canada, uh, I think is influencing the stock market as well. So the U.S. returns uh, have been better. Um, but if you want massive returns, let's get to the next topic, Bitcoin. Bitcoin has been absolutely on fire. If you uh, if you go online or you read a newspaper, you've probably seen some of, some of the headlines. Uh, so Bitcoin, as of today, is around 62,000. It hit up as high as 64,000. So that is up 44% in a month. Bitcoin's up 44% in a month. It's up 137% if you look at the last six months. Um, but if you're going to go back to November 2021, it hit 65,000 or a little more. So it's still not to the all-time peak. So people that bought Back in 2021, in November, would have paid more than it's trading at now. Um, but it's just been an absolute massive increase uh, in the last six 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 months. Uh, and I think the reason is the two of the, the two major events we've been talking about. Right, we've been talking about this for the past year. We've got the Bitcoin ETFs in the states; those were approved in January. There's billions of dollars flowing towards that. And the second event is the halving coming up. So the halving is going to be in April. Uh, best guess, uh, I think I've got a date here. Sometime in April, they expect that, that the, half, the halving to occur. But if you, if you think of those two events, what's happening with the ETF in, in the U.S., so the ETFs are now in the U.S., we get a lot of institutional money, but a lot of individuals now find it easy to invest in Bitcoin. Some of the hedge funds are getting into it now. So when you start getting institutions and individuals into Bitcoin, Hong Kong now seeing a big growth in Bitcoin as well. They, they also accepted the ETF applications. So as this becomes more and more accepted, I think we're going to continue to see it grow. That being said, we are not investment experts. We don't know what's going to happen to Bitcoin. It could go to zero tomorrow. Don't follow our advice. Um, but if we dig into this Bitcoin halving, just to kind of walk you through why it's, why it's so important. Bitcoin, the, the key of Bitcoin is there's only only 21 million coins ever going to be manufactured, right? So what happens in fiat currency, the Canadian dollar, US dollar, the governments come out and just print more money. They print more money. We have inflation. It devalues the currency. That can never happen with Bitcoin. 
So Bitcoin only gets created when the miners mine it. So what they do is the first time when they started mining Bitcoin, they used to get 50 Bitcoins when they mined a certain amount. Okay. Now it's 6.25. And as of April, it's going to go down to 3.125. And the reason they want that that's designed in the original Bitcoin code is they want to limit the increase in the amount of Bitcoin available. Therefore, they want to like limit inflation. They don't want to print unlimited dollars. So there's over 19 million Bitcoins already mined. So there's less than 2 million Bitcoins to go. And it's going to be twice, you're going to get half as much as a miner when you do it. So it's just limiting that supply. Uh, think of it like gold, right? There, there's a limited supply of gold, but they can still go find more gold. You can't go find more Bitcoin. 21 million is going to be the hard cap on that. Um, so I think that's going to continue to drive uh, Bitcoin up is my guess. That's interesting, eh? It's always, Bitcoin's always up to something. <laughs> You're always hearing about it. It's always doing something. Um, so into the real estate side of things, uh, we had some January stats come in. So the average Canadian home price was around 659000 in January 2024. So 0.3% monthly increase and up 7.7% year over year. So we did see that appreciation of 7%. Now, obviously different within different provinces. Um, but nationally, this was cool. So nationally, there were close to 40,000 homes um, sold during the month of January 2024, a seasonally adjusted 18% increase year over year, um, which and there and I was reading a few things and they they kind of think it's because of the weather. You know how it's been so nice in uh, like in Ontario, we talked to, you know, Connor from Ontario, he's telling me about how it's beautiful, you're out for a walk, that does increase sale prices in homes. Like a lot of the time you're not going out in January and whatnot, it's cold, you're bundled up. But they think that maybe because of the weather, we're seeing a, a more increase in uh, the higher increase in sales in the month of January, which is kind of neat. So you're saying global warming is good for real estate sales. Yeah, I'm not <laughs> Gonna, uh, yeah, we're we'll gonna leave that comment. Moving I don't know. On. Yeah, moving on. Um, so for January 2024, uh, the benchmark home prices in Canada, like when we look at it, some of the provinces had a slight increase. You're looking at Alberta and Saskatchewan are a bit up. Um, Ontario, the BC, like, you know, the higher ones, you're looking at a house in uh, British Columbia, 952,000, Ontario, 849. Lowest benchmark price was in New Brunswick though at 283,000. So still get those deals in New Brunswick, right? <laughs> Check those out. Um, so outside of that, we had some really big news that came out uh, from British Columbia, right? It was uh, not exciting news, a little upsetting. Um, they have a new tax on flipping. So they're trying to stop people from uh, flipping. They're going to add an additional tax. So if you don't hold your hold that uh, residence for two years, uh, they're going to tax you. So I think it's 20, yeah, 20% 20 in the first year and it will reduce until it reaches zero on day 730. Um, but that's huge. So they're proposing it for January 1st. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's going to stop. They think that that's going to stop. That's going to help the housing crisis. I, I would like your input on if that's going <laughs> to help the housing crisis, Darren. <laughs> The BC flipping tax is just another example of the government trying to get some votes with stupid, stupid policies that, and the, the net effect is going to be worse. So now 20% extra tax if you flip a house on top of what the government passed last year federally, that if it's no longer capital gains uh, for most times when you're flipping unless you're a business. So the individual, the carpenter, the electrician that, that buys a house that is just in disrepair gets hard money, loan, borrows money at 15%, spends his nights and weekends and fixes it up. Now they're going to be an, there's going to be an extra 20% tax. So what's going to happen? Those individuals aren't going to buy the rehab those homes. Those homes, you can't get mortgages on an inhabitable home. So the only way they can be re, rehabilitated is when a flipper comes in, gets hard money loan and fixes it up. It's going to drive them away from the province. They're going to, what we call BC it. BC, it's BC, policy that's going to drive away investment from BC. The actual effect on the prices in BC, it's like when they stopped, uh, you know, the international buyers and stuff, it's going to have no impact. The amount of people that actually flip a home is such a minuscule portion. Uh, and it's really a lot of these older homes that are fixed up and all of a sudden one, one, one house becomes three or four units. All these things, it's just going to drive those investors to other markets and I think long-term BC is going to suffer for it. I think it's just a vote grab, and I think it's a horrible, rotten, no-good idea. 
Yeah, it's those it's those small real estate investors that are going to get hurt by. It. Like I just it, I don't it, understand why they wouldn't want the houses fixed so that there is more houses on the market. The the, the other thing, it's retroactive, so it's effective January first, twenty and twenty 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 five. So let's say Vancouver's big Toronto and Vancouver are in, uh, the big pre construction places. So you did a pre construction condo where you bought it in twenty twenty two. Okay, you've put your down payment down and say great. Eventually, I'm going to take ownership of that in like three or four years. So now you bought it under the rules that if you sold it, you weren't going to pay this extra tax. So now you don't actually take possession of it till 2025, say three years after you put your your first down payment down. You take possession of it in 2025. Well, maybe some things have changed in those three years and you decide not to keep it or not to rent it. And then you sell that. And even though you really technically bought it in 2022, you didn't take ownership until 2025, you're going to pay an extra 20% tax if you make a profit at that. So it's just punishing the small time investor. The big businesses are going to be fine. It doesn't affect them. It's, It's once again, the small, small business owners, the small real estate investors that are going to be affected. The same thing we saw with the Airbnb. Airbnb. Yeah. And it worries you because uh, we saw the other provinces kind of take hold of the Airbnb, um, you know, rules as well. I really, really hope that the same thing doesn't happen here because it's going to hurt the person that's looking for a unit. The person like if they didn't buy that pre-construction condo, would have that condo been built at all? And that's an entire building that's there for housing, right? A- like that Absolutely doesn't, not. Yeah. It's mostly investors that buy the pre-construction. So the way a pre-construction deal works the, the, the builder has to sell 60% of the units before they can basically get bank financing to start building the property. So now they're not going to be able to attract the investors because the investors are going to say, I'm getting hammered on taxes. I can't do the Airbnb. I have this extra surtax. Why would I do it? And every real estate group that I belong to, and I belong to a bunch of them, and I list, follow a lots of them, you know what everyone's talking about now in Canada? How to invest in the U.S. real estate market. How to, come on down to the U.S. and we'll have a trip on how to buy homes down here. There's real estate groups in Canada organizing U.S. trips for their Canadian investors that normally invest in Canada to say, no, let's go to the U.S. because they're more landlord-friendly rules and we don't have these stupid taxes put on top of already very high taxes uh, so let's go to the States and get away from all this government BS. Well, and the only way to fix the housing problem is with real estate investors. <laughs> like that is the only way, like the government's obviously not fixing it. Like we've <laughs> given them their chance. They're not, they need to attract real estate investors. So they come in, invest in our, in our country and, and fix this problem. Right. That's, that's where the money's so going to come from. This, this will mean fewer places get developed. How that's going to help drive down the price of houses is beyond me. Clearly, you you, you need a, a a lot of years in government to lose your faculties to think that is going to make sense. All right, so that's BC news. Now, <laughs> sorry BC, so, sorry BC, uh, they be seated. Uh, okay, industry news. Okay, I, I found this uh, industry news that I thought was really cool. Uh, so you could never have too much life insurance, Christina. So HSBC in Hong Kong just set the Guinness Book of World Records. For the largest insurance policy, it's a whole-of-life policy. I don't know exactly what that means. I'm, we don't operate in Hong Kong. But the death benefit on this policy was $250 million, so a quarter of a billion dollars. So clearly, wealthy people are buying life insurance. Uh, the same company said in the past year they've sold 10 policies with face amounts over $50 million. So... Uh, Christine and I want to put it out there right now to all our listeners. If anyone would like to buy a $250 million life insurance policy, it's controllingcompound.com. Darren and Christina, give us a call. We're happy to sit down with you, wherever you are. Uh, But that was pretty cool. Uh, $250 million uh, policy. Again, just showing wealthy people obviously see the benefits of of insurance. And then on the Canadian market, um, again, I don't want to say it's all all because of infinite banking and control and compound, but insurance is becoming more popular um, in Canada in the first month of this year in January. Uh, MIB Group reports that applications were up 10% compared to January of last year and up 20% uh, from December. So 
Number of life insurance applications in Canada up 10% versus a year ago. That's pretty significant. Yeah, it's, it's good to see. You see that it's growing and life insurance policies are always a good thing. And then on to some economic news. So the Bank of Canada is projecting inflation will decrease uh, in 2024 down to about 2.5% by the end of the year. Uh, economic growth is expected to be slow for the first half and then and then slowly uh, pick up. Um, inflation is supposed to stay relatively where it is now, around 3% until summer and then dip to 25 so hopefully that's uh, gonna gonna get to get to two percent in 2025. But we talked a little bit about the 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 economic growth numbers uh, up one percent the GDP. Well, if you look at the real GDP, if you take inflation out, uh, it was actually 0.1 percent. And and again, we talk about the smoke and mirrors. So GDP is you know you take all the Canadians and you multiply that by their output to get the GDP. Well, what's been one of the, and even with that, we have 0.1 or 1% growth, okay, which is not great. We have an extra million people. So think of that million people, what they produced. So if we didn't bring in that million people, what would our GDP be? Well, I think, I think we'd be in a recession. So, so we're artificially propping up this GDP, GDP because we get a million new people uh, in the country producing something, producing some value. That GDP gets increased by those million new people. Um, so Canada is not in a fantastic spot um, right now, but we're not technically in a recession. But again, that real business business investments declined for the sixth time in seven quarters. So businesses, what they're investing in, in the business has declined six of the last seven quarters. Again, that's not a long-term that's not good long term for the growth of the Canadian economy, and that's why a lot of people are thinking the Canadian economy for the next ten or twenty years is not going to grow as much as some of our G seven partners. So big, uh, big economic news there if you if you factor in the population. So more on positive news. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> some positive news. Well, Bitcoin uh, was positive. That yeah, was that's awesome. right. We did that. We talked about that a minute ago, though. We got to go back bounce, to some positive bounce. Back. bounce. Economic yeah. news, bad. <laughs> Bitcoin, good. 250 million death benefit, good. Yeah. yeah. So back to control on compound news, which, again, is positive. So uh, this last month, we were at a uh, conference in Calgary with Ken Dunn. We did the Real Estate Investor Summit there. That was awesome. Yeah, it was fantastic. We had, a great time we had such there. a great time. It, yeah. was, it was so cool uh, to meet uh, just so many people out west. Uh, we're going to make more Western stops. Uh, I like those Alberta and BC people. They're just, uh, we, we get along really well. We had three action packed days there and met a lot of really nice school people and, uh, yeah, couldn't, couldn't have had a better time. Yeah, it was great. Lots of, lots of learning. There's a lot of learn about how you can create your own uh, mutual fund trust for investing, for getting, um, you know, fundraising for registered funds, which I thought was pretty cool. That one was a new one for me. So I quite enjoyed learning about that mutual fund trust that people can actually create themselves. Um, But the best part was definitely the networking, love meeting new people, which was great. And Michelle Romanoff was great to see again. She, uh, I I love when she just, uh, she does tell stories, right? Like she does, she does her formal kind of presentation, but then she came to cocktail hour one night and just, uh, people could just ask her questions and like, you know, what were your, what were your hits and what are your misses and the way she, she handles it. Like she's, she's, she's awesome. Oh, I know. She had, yeah, she had a couple good ones and I had seen her last time at the event, but like she had a couple tidbits for me. She, I always leave with something from her, right? So she had her shoulda, coulda, woulda. We don't do shoulda, coulda, woulda. Yeah. We leave that stuff behind. And then she did, I really like, she was talking about, someone asked about like, you know, women in business. And I'm going to talk about this in a minute. It's Women's International Women's Day is coming up in March. So she had made the comment that, you know, y- you just, you just were, y- you can't give yourself an excuse to not do better. She's like, yeah, you know, it could be a bit tougher, but I don't take that and put that in my head and say, that's the reason that I'm not getting better. Oh, I could say that it's because I'm a woman. It could be because I'm five feet tall is what she said might be the reason, (laughs) but you don't give yourself an excuse um, to not drive forward and do better. And uh, obviously where she is right now, um, the, at the level of success that she is and seeing what she's doing, uh, this, she's a very successful woman. And she kept saying, you know, two generations ago, my uh, grandmother had two, two choices. She could be a secretary, she could be a teacher. That was it. That's all she had. So as a woman, it does make you, you know, realize like we've got a lot of, uh, we've got a lot of opportunity out there that we can take advantage of and we can sit there and be like oh I'm not doing as well because I'm a woman in business well that's bull 
right? You get up, you do better and you grind harder. And I really, that was an awesome takeaway from her at, at that conference. Cool. I, uh, I, I think she's fantastic. And all the other, all the women there, she has the nicest shoes in the world. Always. <laughs> every, Always. Time, every time we yeah. see her. I think they like, were Louis Vuitton's this I was time. Like, They're oh very my. nice. Yeah. I, I don't notice <laughs> shoes other than when I see her. I was like, holy <laughs> crap. I think those are really nice shoes. Uh, Okay, uh, so last month, uh, oh, we got CNC news. Sorry, let's let's uh, let multifamily. Oh, yeah. Oh. So we just talked about the conference. Sorry, we got all excited, but we have another conference coming up too in May. A very exciting conference with lots of uh, lots of exciting speakers. So we are going to. Well, Darren's going to be speaking at the multifamily conference. I'll be there as well. It looks like an amazing lineup. Um, Seth Ferguson's putting that on. Um, I, we were there. La- I was there last year where they had Grant Cardone and A Rod speaking. Um, they've got a pretty sweet lineup for this year. So it's been announced. Um, this year they have Jordan Belfort, so the Wolf Without Wall Street. That's going to be interesting. <laughs> I am very interested to hear this one. Um, they have Robert from the Dragon's Den, so another dragon coming out, which is exciting. Nice to see. And then they actually have Elena Cardone, so Grant's wife is going to be speaking, which you know that's I think she's, that's pretty exciting too. She, she looks like a powerhouse. She is. She is a power. And Darren Mitchell. Oh yeah. That. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Yes. Headline. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to that. I, th- I think that's the largest real estate conference in Canada. Um, so it's cool to be part of that and see those awesome speakers. Uh, and then podcast wise, uh, th- first of all, thanks everyone for for listening to the podcast. We appreciate it. Um, please, uh, please subscribe on all our socials. Please like us. That really helps. But the podcast really taken off. So we, we, we thank all our listeners. Last month, we had some great podcasts. We did the Dirty Little Secrets of CPP. Our RRSPs, not CPP. Sorry. Sorry, there was a typo that there. That was my typo. That's sorry. <laughs> I apologize. We, we, I apologize. We, we, we that did. was a good one, though. If you haven't watched that episode, go back. <laughs> Dirty Little Secrets the- of CPP <laughs> is an awesome one. Uh, you can find that RSPs. on YouTube as well. Uh, the Dirty Little Secrets of RRSPs was also incredible last month. Uh, we did one for business owners on the capital dividend, capital dividend account. Uh, we get a lot of good feedback from business owners on that. Like, how does this money flow out of my business to me or my family tax-free? How does that work? We dug into that. Uh, speaking of Bitcoin, we dug into how Bitcoin is taxed. So do I pay t- tax on Bitcoin? How much? How is it How is it classified? We did one on that. Uh, and then we did one on the secret asset class. I think the secret asset class, sometimes of the wealthy people call it. Uh, and that was participating whole life as an asset class. So not borrowing and using it for other things, just purely as an asset class. Does it make sense to have a portion of your portfolio uh, in this whole life? And we address that in a podcast. Yep. And we've got some very exciting um, podcasts for next month. So we're going to continue our Bitcoin series. So always something to talk about with Bitcoin. Um, another one for business owners. So we did, we have been asked to, you know, talk a little bit more about things that impact business owners. And we did a podcast on the lifetime capital gains exemption. So when you go to sell your business, how does that lifetime capital gains exemption work? We dug into that. Another um, cool one that I like digging into was how does the participating fund invest? So like how are these funds able to pay dividends every single year for 150 years going back? We dug into exactly what they're investing in. So real estate side, I'm not going to share. You got to listen, but you're going to want to hear about it. It's pretty cool. And then another great one uh, that's coming out is intergenerational wealth transfers using infinite banking. So or the infinite banking concept. Um, so we're really going to dig into how you can pass down wealth to the next generation. I know it's it's a hot topic. There's a lot of wealth. Like when you hear the statistics of wealth that's going to be transferred in the next 10, 20 years, the numbers are crazy and we have the best way to do it. So yeah. why not? It's the most tax it, efficient right? way and the best yeah. way to trans- transfer, transfer that wealth from generation to generation. Awesome. All right. Well, that's the March update. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to this podcast. If you're listening on YouTube, please like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. If you're listening on your favorite podcast platform, please leave us a five-star review and subscribe. And if you want more information, check out our website, controlandcompound.com, and you can sign up for an education session with one of our wealth coaches.